and you know what gentleness is because everything goes very smoothly. So you know what these things are just by their results. Which is why in meditation, actually in life, one of the most important qualities is mindfulness, is awareness. I use the two words together because they're basically the same. And what awareness is, or what mindfulness is, is you know how you're feeling, you know how your meditation is going, you know how your body uh, is feeling. Mindfulness is that which can give you feedback. So during the day, during this retreat, you're aware of your bodily feelings, you're aware of your mental state, your emotional state, and you can see just how that changes. For example, you know when the body is relaxed? It, because people are very much into their bodies in our modern world. We're very aware of our bodies with health, with exercise, with eating, and with you know, physical pleasure. So we can understand when our bodies are tense, we can understand when our bodies are relaxed. So we can start just with body awareness, and then we actually find out that when we make peace with our body, when we're kind to it, when we're gentle with it, we find the whole body relaxes. And that gives us feedback. The mindfulness shows us that the body is moving from tension to release, from even pain into sort of uh, relief from pain. That mindfulness gives you feedback so you know what making peace, what being kind, what being gentle actually is. I did mention in passing that people think they know what compassion is. But so many people don't, they know the word and they think they understand what compassion is. That's why in places like Singapore on Waysack Day, compassion that you buy these birds and fish and you release them on Waysack Day and all they end up doing is actually getting eaten by other birds or dying in a, in a river or in a sea where they don't belong, where they can't survive. We think that's compassion and kindness. To me, I understood what compassion wasn't when I heard the story of the Boy Scout. You know, a Boy Scout is supposed to do one good deed a day. And so the Boy Scout helped an old lady cross a busy road. He thought that was compassion until he found out the old lady didn't want to go. <laughs> She's quite happy where she was. We don't know what compassion is sometimes, and because of that, we sometimes really mess things up. So, you can understand what compassion is just by a simple exercise. You know, be aware of a part of your body now which is aching or which is stiff. Can you be mindful of that part of the body which is you know, not really quite, quite comfortable? Now you're mindful of that area. Just relax that part of the body. Just move the knee or just you know, scratch the, the itch on your face or whatever it is, just to see if you can relieve that ache or pain. And if the mindfulness tells you that ache or pain is being relieved, the sensation is getting less, and what you've just done is compassion, <coughs> is kindness. That's what actually opens up the body, that's what loosens up things. That's what relieves tension and tightness. So now, ah, now that's what compassion is. And once you learn these things, you learn that actually what I am saying is very profound. Making peace, if you really know what peace is, and you make peace, you'll find your mind relaxes. And your mindfulness can notice that. Instead of a mind which is like tense and tight, like the body is sometimes tense and tight, instead of having these aches and pains in the mind, like you have aches and pains in the body, you just make peace and the whole thing gets very loose and even. You, you're kind and the whole thing relaxes. You're gentle and the mind becomes smooth and even. And it's from the mindfulness you understand. Ah, oh, now that's what the teacher meant by making peace, being kind, being gentle. That which does actually relax things. So it does require a little bit of awareness, and especially awareness to see, well, you're making this attitude of mind, make peace, being kind, being gentle. What's its result? 
Is it going in the right direction? So if you sit here and say, make peace, being kind, being gentle, <laughs> you realise you're not going in the right direction. So you're not making peace, being kind, being gentle, you're doing something else. Well, if you're sitting here and you start thinking, I wonder what the stock market is doing today. I wonder what my wife is doing, she's all alone. Or even worse, my husband, he knows I'm going to be away for nine days, I wonder what he's up to. <laughs> Whatever that is, that's not making peace, being kind, being gentle, because the mindfulness, the awareness, gives you feedback, you're not becoming more peaceful. You're not becoming kind, you're becoming more judgmental, becoming more afraid, and the mind becomes more bumpy. So, by having some mindfulness and seeing what happens afterwards, you understand whether you're going in the right direction or not. If you're sitting here, Make peace, being kind, being gentle. And the mind becomes so free, so rested, so relaxed. And all this tension of having to do things, having to get somewhere, having to achieve something, all that thing which tightens up the mind, all disappears. And the mindfulness is telling you, wow, this is peaceful. This is what meditation is all about. So it means that what you've just been doing, you have been making peace. You have been kind. You have been gentle, because this is its result. So please practice that mindfulness, it's giving you feedback. And even <coughs> during a meditation session, you know, practice mindfulness every couple of minutes if you wish. So you feel you are actually going in the correct direction. And there will be many, many times on this retreat, everyone, even the most hopeless meditator, you do actually feel peace, you do feel relaxed simply because the whole Jhana Grove Retreat Center is designed for this. It pulls you along in spite of yourself. After a while you just can't resist it. You do relax, you do get peaceful, and you feel this beautiful sense of ease. You're here, you've just got not a worry in the world. You're not worried about your business or your family or the stock exchange or the football or your health or anything. You're just totally relaxed, just happy to be here. You know, and you feel this beautiful sense of peace and this freedom. It's like before you were in a prison and you had prison guards always saying, get up, sit down, do this and do that. And now that prison guard has disappeared. You can just sit here and be peaceful. You're not being compelled to do anything. You're just sitting here at peace, still and free experience that. You know, that's what meditation is. A lot of times people sort of ask, what, what are the jhanas really like? Come on, Ajahn Brahm, explain them to me. Because people always like these, you know, these detailed explanations. And they're always like, nimitas, what are real nimitas? Can you please, please, please tell me? Now, a, a detailed description, please. But, you know, those are just the words. The experience is the most important. And it's those experiences which you have of peace, of stillness, of freedom. And that's what the meditation is. So everyone here eventually experiences a taste of this. So once you experience a taste of it, you know exactly what it is. And once you, ex or the, for any peace you've experienced here, or any other place when you're meditating, those of you who've had peace, stillness, and it's so delightful, just Keep going in that direction, amplify it. When it gets more full, that's what the jhana is. A deeper state of peace. A more beautiful sense of, of happiness. And just a really, really great sense of freedom. That relaxed state of mind, which is really, really you know, multiple of what you're experiencing already. And that's what the meditation actually is. So that's why that most meditation teachers, they do emphasize mindfulness, because that's what gives you the feedback. The trouble is, and this is the difficulty in meditation, that mindfulness is not something which you can just have, it's something which you cultivate. And you don't cultivate mindfulness in the way that you cultivated all the other um, uh, qualities and skills and achievements you've got in the world. You don't cultivate mindfulness through hard work or through effort. Mindfulness is generated by stillness. And this is why it's a chicken and egg thing. 
You need stillness to be mindful, and you need mindfulness to be still. So what happens is these things go together, they work together. You're a little bit more mindful, which means you become more aware, so you can understand and appreciate what you need to do to become more still. And the more still you are, the more powerful is the mindfulness, which means that you can actually go deeper into stillness, because you're more aware, you get better feedback. <coughs> so these two things, the mindfulness and the stillness, will always work together. But to get that initial bit of mindfulness going, so you can understand what's going on in your mind, and you can get the feedback, which is clear, so you know whether you're going the right direction or going the wrong direction. To get that initial part of mindfulness, that's why I've asked you to rest. Because if you're tired, your brain hasn't got much energy, and basically the screen is dull. You can't see very much, you can't hear very much, even feelings in the body. It's just you know, hardly any feelings there, you're dull. And one of the extreme cases of lack of mindfulness is called depression. When people are so tired, their brain is so exhausted, they just, whatever they see is grey. And whatever they taste, it's just got no flavour to it. And even like music or, or scents, they just can't smell them. Because their mind is so dull. You ask anybody, hopefully it's not you who've been in great um, uh, depths of depression. You ask anybody who's depressed, and even like a flower, they just can't see any beauty there. It's just yellow, what's that about? Big deal. So sort of the, the colour is not strong enough for them. You know, when I first went to UK, you know, after being a monk for a long time, when my mindfulness has been developed enough, I can understand what's going on. And I mentioned, I think I mentioned in another talk, I went there during the winter time. And for those of you who know, like, uh, like even London in the winter time, it's so far north that the sun only comes up about 10 o'clock in the morning and it goes, sets about 2 p.m. We've only got four hours of sunlight, so it's dark and it's grey. And even in noon, you know, the light is very, very dark. I remember that as a kid, you go to school for nine o'clock in the dark, you come home in the dark. It's made up for during the summertime, because in the summertime there's this almost light all day. But during the wintertime it's so dark and grey that there is a type of depression for people who live in a country like that called Seasonal Affective Disorder. You know, it's just one of these acronyms, S-A-D, SAD. <laughs> and all it is, is because the light is grey, and because, you know, you've seen people in England, because it's cold, they wear all these overcoats and hats, you just can't even see people. Here in Australia, it's really bright, and so, you know, people wear bright coloured clothes, and you can see their hair, you can see their face, and, if you go to some of these beaches, you can see everything else as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> sort of, at least it's alive, it's bright, which means that people in Australia don't get that SAD. No. But in the Northern Hemisphere, they do. And when I was talking to my brother about this, they say it was a very easy therapy. All they did with anyone who got depressed because it was that time of year in the Northern Hemisphere was to take them into a room with very bright lights. And they were made to wear these Hawaiian shirts, you know, with lots of colour, and have very sort of vibrant music. You know, everything just to get their senses to become alive again. And that's all they really needed. There was so lack of mindfulness, because there was basically nothing to see or feel, that they're almost their mind had turned off. Now you may not have seasonal affective disorder, maybe you maybe have Singapore affective disorder. <laughs> You've been working so hard, your brain is tired. And if your brain is tired, it hasn't got enough energy, not enough gas in the tank, so what you see, what you hear, what you feel, is only 10% of what's there. Which means the mind is not alive. So the first thing to do is let you to rest. And when you rest, basically you rest your body and your brain especially. So don't go thinking about things, don't go worrying about things. 
especially when you're a retreat like this, don't go figuring out the meaning of life. Because that, you know, we work out the meaning of the stock market, the meaning of business, and then you come here and find meaning of life. <laughs> and it's just more working of your brain. Give your brain a break. <laughs> so you just rest. So keep it very simple these first few days. If you want to know what the meaning of life, go out into nature and just watch a tree grow. That was one of my favorite pastimes, watching trees grow. And there's lots of trees here, and they do grow. Those of you who were here last year, they've actually grown more than last year. They, were there. they do grow. You've just got to go and look and find a tree and stay there long enough to see it grow. If you look around, that's when it grows. You've got to keep watching it. In other words, learn how to do nothing and enjoy doing nothing. Learn how to feel. Learn how to see. Can you see? You think you can see, but see if you can look at a tree or the horizon or a star at night and just see without giving it a name. It took me a long time to learn how to see after being brainwashed by a place like Cambridge. <laughs> you knew all the names of the stars. You knew whether it was a galaxy there or whether it was a, a dual star or whether it was a nebula or whatever it was, you had all the names. Which means when I looked at the sky, I could never appreciate its beauty. And I, I deliberately, the first years in Thailand, I deliberately forgot all of that. So I could see the stars just like everybody else. They're beautiful. When you know the names, all you know is the names. You don't see the stars. Or like some of these botanists. They walk around this property here and say, Oh, that's a eucalyptus Theodora, or that's a eucalyptus something else. And that they can see the names, but they can't see the tree. So see if you can learn how to see on this retreat. See if you can learn how to hear. So when there's a sound of someone snoring in the morning, you can enjoy it. Mmm, beautiful. Resonance sound because you're because we're judging when we say they shouldn't snore in the morning, they should go get a sleep. If they're gonna snore, go and snore in their own room, don't disturb my meditation. Blah, 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 blah. Then you're not really hearing what you're listening to most of the time is the reaction in your mind. That's why I often say that if you really know how to listen, how to hear, no one can ever upset you, even if they call you a pig. You hear the sound, but you don't pay any attention to the reaction inside of you. You listen to sound, not being in your head, but listening to sound. That's all it is, it's just sound. Or even better in a retreat like this, learn how to feel. I gave you an indication last night but the feeling in your bottom when you're sitting down. Feel the sensations in the soles of your feet as you walk outside this room. Even better if you can take off your socks and just feel the wooden floor. Feel the concrete path. Get more into physical feelings. You're becoming more aware. And for those people who think so much, it's one of the biggest problems for people who start meditating. They're really so much in their head. They think, think, think so much, so often. One of the best antidotes is a walk in, in nature. You listen. There's so many sounds in the forest. But if you're thinking of the meaning of life or thinking of your problems and what you're going to do for business when you go back, you can never hear anything. But when you go to the forest and listen, even if it's the wind in the trees, and listen with 100% of your mind, it's very beautiful. You're feeling, you're here. And such will stop the mind thinking. When it's raining, it's supposed to rain next week, feel the rain. Don't use an umbrella. Feel the rain, get wet, <coughs> experience things. Go out into the sun and feel its warmth instead of trying to hide. So you get real. And as you start to feel, as you start to hear, as you start <coughs> to see, you find you are waking up. Your mindfulness is increasing. 
And one of the benefits of that, which I'm sure you'll appreciate, is that when you have breakfast or lunch, it tastes much more delicious. Simply because your senses are becoming more refined. I'm not sure how the food is here because I'm eating over at uh, Bodhinyana Monastery. But you usually find that after a few days of meditation, if you do get peaceful, the food tastes more and more and more delicious. I know that people have said before, oh, the food at Jhana Grove is just so delicious. It's not. It's ordinary food done on the cheap to save money. <laughs> but because you're mindful and aware, you can actually pick up more flavours. The old story I like telling is the very first meditation retreat which I ever did when I was 19, 18 or 19, uh, at Cambridge University. Our meditation group, we, we hired three boarding houses <coughs> during the vacation and we had a retreat there. And of course, the food was provided by the boarding house. And for those of you who've ever been to a boarding house in <coughs> England 40 years ago, you'll probably remember that the food was disgusting. <laughs> we used to call it, you know, usually meat and two vegetables. And sometimes you couldn't tell the difference, what was the meat, what was the vegetable, <laughs> because it all tasted the same. <laughs> Any flavour was boiled out of it. And so, so, you know, the British were never known for their cuisine in those days. You want to get some good food, go to France or somewhere. But the English, they just didn't know how to cook in those days. And of all of the cooks and chefs in that whole country, the very worst, the bottom of the pile, were working for poor students in boarding houses. And it was true that when I signed up for that retreat, I seriously considered getting sandwiches or getting something so I could eat. But to my surprise, my relief and my pleasure, the food was delicious. And really I thought it was the cook at first. I thought that because of my good karma, I must have got a boarding house with the only good cook in the whole of the country. But now I realise it was nothing to do with the cook. Because my mindfulness was getting very strong, because I was getting very peaceful, the tiny, the infinitesimal bit of flavour left after all that boiling, I could pick up. <laughs> I was so sensitive that there's only a tiny bit of taste left after all that terrible cooking, but I could actually feel it, I could taste it. Because my mindfulness was that strong. And I realise that this is where it's coming from. By resting, relaxing, you're becoming more alive. You can taste more, you can see deeper, you can feel more, the whole body starts to tingle. Wonderful. You are becoming mindful. You're becoming aware. The power of that mindfulness is increasing. That is my first goal for you to get you alert, aware, awake. And once that happens, once you're aware, it's very easy to see what's going on in your mind when you're meditating. <coughs> Otherwise, if you don't have that basic mindfulness, you're meditating, basically you don't know what you're doing. You just can't see, you're just like walking in a dark room. And you keep falling over things and you don't know why, because you can't see. So by just resting, relaxing, doing things slowly, not speaking too much, you'll find your mindfulness increases. And as it increases, not only do you get these, these, uh, these other benefits, these uh, free gifts which come along with the meditation, like delicious food and feeling more alive and more relaxed, you also become much more aware of what's going on inside of you. Your mental world becomes much clearer to you. And then actually you can start to see what I mean by the feedback. You're meditating here and you can see what makes you more tense. You can see what makes you more relaxed. You can see 
how to let go. And that's actually what happens, you're sitting here, closing your eyes, the mindfulness starts to be strong enough, you can see what you're doing. When I tell you to let go of the past and the future, you know exactly what, you, what I mean, and you do it. So you just let go of the past. Well, you, we all know that the past is finished with, it's dead, you can't change it. But how many of you can stop thinking about the past? You know why? Because you may stop for a second, but because you're not paying attention, the mindfulness is not strong, all the past habits come up and before you know it, you're thinking about the past. Your mindfulness was not strong enough. You know, you all know, and I've said many times, not to worry about the future, who knows what's going to happen. But you can't stop yourself worrying about the future. You can't even stop yourself thinking about what you're going to have for lunch today. And because of that, you know, you can't have peace. And again, this is what happens. You start off, okay, sit down, just make peace, be kind, be gentle, be in the present moment. And before you know it, you're off thinking about the future. The awareness wasn't strong enough. So eventually when the awareness is strong enough, you're sitting here, okay, just be in the present moment. And the thought about the future comes up, you see it straight away, you say, no thank you. I prefer to stay in the present moment. A dream about the past comes, no thank you, I'd rather stay here. The mindfulness can give you feedback, it tells you what you're doing. And once you have that feedback, then you have the ability to be peaceful. Without that feedback, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where you're going, which means you go all over the place. So that's why the first thing which we want to do here is to create that mindfulness, make it strong enough, and then we can really teach how to take that mindfulness and direct it to creating a very peaceful, still, happy mind. One wonderful way of creating that mindfulness at the very beginning, which I wanted to talk about today, is doing the walking meditation. Doing the walking meditation, as I mentioned last night, do not close your eyes. And it's not just because you don't want to bang into the wall, because I want you to become more alert. Sometimes closing your eyes, most of the time, the only occasion when you close your eyes is to go to sleep. So psychologically, something happens in the brain there. Oh, she's closing her eyes, that means I must go to sleep. But how many of you go to sleep with your eyes open? So at least when you're walking with your eyes open, you're giving the signal to your brain, keep awake. So that's number one. And number two is when your eyes open, you are sensitive to what you're seeing. You're, and please, again, take your socks off when you're doing the walking meditation, because I want you to be aware. Feel those sensations in your feet. And you don't have to walk in here. You can walk along the corridors, you know, the covered paths, they're wide enough so people can pass you if you're walking meditation there. You can even walk on the grass next to the stupa. You can even walk round and round if you like. Just walk round three times, turn around and go back again. I don't care what you do. <laughs> but learn how to feel more. So when you're taking your shoes off, you're actually feeling sensations on your skin. And feel the wind, feel the rain, feel the cold, feel the heat. Don't always put the blankets on. <coughs> because when you put the blankets on, you're not feeling anything anymore. Just so that's why you put the blankets on to go to sleep, so you don't feel anything. So you can turn off and, uh, and disappear. Feel the cold. Become alive. Get that mindfulness strong. And when that happens, when you're doing walking meditation, that's what the first stage is, actually, just to be aware. To be aware of where you are and what you're doing, which is just walking. So when we do the walking, take your shoes off, if you're sitting in, uh, doing walking meditation here, that's fine. Feel the sensation of that uh, mat on the soles of your feet. And feel what it's like to walk. Which part of the foot moves off the carpet first? Which is the last part of the foot 
which leaves the carpet. Does your foot go vertically up or does it go back a bit or forward a bit? How does it go up when you're walking? Don't walk unnaturally, just be aware of how the natural movement of the feet happens when you walk. After it goes up, how does it go forward? Does it go actually horizontal? Does it go curve up or curve down, left or right? How does it move? So be aware of that. And also be aware of all the muscles in your legs for just one step. There's so many muscles have to be used just to do one step. And as the foot goes down, which part of the foot meets the carpet first? Which last? And then you feel the body move to transfer the weight of your body onto that foot which has just finished its step to release the other foot to move. So you become aware of all these incredible sensations in your body just with one step. You're beginning to feel, becoming aware. Of course, if you're still thinking about the past or the future, where I'm going to do afterwards and planning the meaning of your life and the nature and what you're going to do about this problem or that problem, you're missing the opportunity to be aware. You're still in your head, tiring your brain even more. So learn how to feel sensations in your feet. So you have to be in the present moment first of all, not thinking too much, be silent and just feel. And so you do that natural pace from one end to the other, turn around and come back again. Because it really doesn't matter where you're going. Your job in walking meditation is to get enough awareness of the body to feel all these sensations. And once you can do that, not only are you aware and your mindfulness is strong, it's also very pleasant which is one of the other aspects of mindfulness. The more mindful you are, the more happy you feel. The reason is this, that what mindfulness is, is the energy of the mind. When it's high energy, you can see very clearly. Low energy, like depression, you could hardly see at all. That's why depression, it's not just seeing, you feel terrible as well. But for those of you who like coffee, you have a cup of coffee in the morning and all your depression is gone. Some people say, I daren't speak to my husband before he's had his first cup of coffee, he's always grumpy. But give him a cup of coffee and he's a human being again instead of <laughs> some monster. <laughs> and so are you. Why is that? Why are people happier after they've had a good cup of coffee? What it's done is given them energy to their mind and they're more awake, they're more alert. Like the caffeine or the tea is like fake energy, but it's still energy, I use it as well. But when you have strong mindfulness, your mind is energised because you've rested and been still. And not only is it energised, you can see, you can feel, and you are generally happier. So when you are walking meditation, you know that it's working, if not only can you experience much more of what's going on in your legs, but you've also got a greater sense of happiness. You're at peace, <coughs> relaxed. And you're having happiness with the meditation. And if that happiness comes up, please don't be afraid of it. Please um, encourage it. It's part of the meditation. It's just a sign your mindfulness is increasing. And as your mindfulness increases more and more and more, so does your happiness increase more and more and more. And that is why the, when people come and report their meditation during their interviews, which are this morning and this afternoon as well, I'm not really looking at what you say, because people can fake it very easily. Say, oh, I saw this beautiful nimitta. Oh, I know the meaning of life now. Oh, I saw the Buddha. I understand the Four Noble Truths. I'm not listening to what you say. Very often I look at your mouth. That is a sign of how wise you are. If the corners of your mouth are turned down, sorry, you're not wise. <laughs> you're miserable. <laughs> if the corners of your mouth are turned up, that's a good sign. 
And if your corners of your mouth are turned up so they're meeting your ears, that means you've just had a jhana. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Because the more mindful you are, the more energized, the just the happier you are. And you know, that's one of the reasons I had enough insight, even as a, as a lay Buddhist, to know that any miserable monk could not have really attained anything. They didn't know what they were talking about. So when I went to all these different monks in London, I looked at who were the happy ones and who were the miserable ones. No way would I become a student of a miserable teacher. <laughs> and it was actually the Thais and the Tibetans who were the happiest. But the Thais just beat them, especially a monk like Ajahn Chah. He was a very, very happy monk. There's a reason for that. And you all know that reason. So that this is what happens when you really get into the meditation. You get a smile on your face. And it's not a fake smile. You're not putting it on for other people to impress them. You just can't help it. You are happy because you are mindful, because you are energized. This is what's supposed to happen. And it's nature, that's all. So when you're doing walking meditation, See if you can also be aware of you know, the great indicator of meditation, the mouth. See, down, up, how far has it got up? <laughs> and that tells you how things are going. So when you do the walking meditation, be really aware of the sensations. No past, no future, no thinking, just feel. And we can do that for the next you know, day, the basic instruction. Rest because you're still tired, many of you. You're not used to this uh, practice where there's n you're not told to do anything, you're not stimulated by movies or by TV. So because there's no external stimulation, you will become dull for the first few days. But once that dullness is finished through resting, once you've learned how to feel, to see, to hear, without thinking and giving things names, once that is done, you will find that you become more alert, more awake. Mindfulness is growing. Do a lot of walking meditation because that increases the basic awareness. And once that awareness is there, you know what I mean by feedback. <coughs> and then you find you can make peace, be kind, be gentle. And you can see its results straight away. You're aware enough to see what these things mean. And you know the path of meditation. It gets very, very still very deep, very peaceful, and you have a wonderful time. But for those of you, the other little first beginning uh, instruction I'd like to give you is there's still many of you, because don't think it's your bad, your hopeless, who can't stop thinking. <coughs> That's one of the biggest difficulties for people who begin their meditation. It's always think, 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 and think, think, think. And they can't stop it. So, for you, you develop some techniques so you can actually stop your thoughts and learn how to be silent. And one of the most effective techniques which I've developed over the last few years is just the, the mantra chant. To get a mantra which you say to yourself. Also, we had some people from Indonesia here last week. So if ever you go to Indonesia, you know, they always have a Buddhist greeting called Namo Buddhaya. So when people greet each other, they say, Namo Buddhaya, basically homage to the Buddha. So to them I said, that should be your chant to stop you thinking. <coughs> the Buddha called it, first of all, substitution. So instead of thinking about anything, instead of thinking about all the hundreds and millions of things you can think about, in your mind you chant to yourself, Namo Buddhaya. But with a difference. You just say Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. You get bored after a while. With a mantra chant, you should always chant it syllable by syllable. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya. That actually stops you thinking because you can't do two things at the same time. But, 
As you settle down, you extend the spaces between the syllables. Na, mo, put, da, ya. And the more you slow down, the more spaces you put between the syllables. Na, mo, put, da, ya. Na, mo. If you start falling asleep, na mo put da ya na mo put da. If you start thinking, close up the gaps. So that gives you a little way that you can actually work with a mantra. Because what happens when you have the mantra, you can't think, you can't sort of go to sleep. And as you start to relax and you become mindful, you extend the gaps between the, the syllables. Na, mo. But if you go too far, you fall asleep or you get thoughts. So close them up a bit. And as you settle down more and more and more, you can extend the gaps, na, and you're perfectly aware of the silence between the gaps, but you can't keep that silence for too long. But, wait until the silence becomes a bit unstable, then da, yeah. So that way you can actually work with the mantra, extending the spaces in between, or closing them up. I know in Thai they do the mantra buddho, but really I think that's a bit too short. In, I taught before over in um, Singapore, the, you know, the Om Mani Padmi Hum, that's a bit too long. You know, or Ma Ni Pa Mi Hum. So I like the Namu Buddhaya one, that's just about the right length. Na Mo Buddhaya, five syllables. And what that means is you can actually recite that to yourself extending the space between, in the space between this silence, and as you get used to the silence, it grows, 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 grows. And you find you're developing mindfulness, silence, in the present moment. <coughs> it's a wonderful little technique which you may use. If you're doing walking meditation, you can't stop thinking, again, focus on the mantra, nat mo buddhaya, putting spaces in between. Sitting meditation and all these thoughts come up, okay, no more buddhaya, no more buddhaya. But always focus on the spaces and increase them. When those spaces are very long, you don't need the no more buddhaya anymore. You've got silence, you've got mindfulness, you've got awareness, so then you can just carry on. So that's a talk this morning on establishing your mindfulness as a prerequisite. Making peace, being kind, being gentle works, but only if you have the mindfulness first of all. As the beginning mindfulness starts, you can make peace, be kind, be gentle much more easily, and the mindfulness will increase. You'll be able to sort of get more still, the mindfulness will increase even more. So by the end of the retreat, I can give some deeper teachings. For the time being, learn how to be aware. Oh, one more teaching on this. Eating and drinking. When you're doing eating lunch today, please do the one spoon at a time practice. Which means you have your food in front of you. You take some food on the spoon or the fork, and you lift it up and you put it into your mouth. Most people have another spoonful waiting in line. They have some other food piled up for number three and they're looking around to see what they're going to have number four. <laughs> they're way ahead of themselves. Which means they're not even tasting the food they're eating now because they're thinking what they're going to have three spoons ahead. <laughs> so, what to do is one spoon at a time. So whatever you're eating on a chopstick, on a fork, I don't care, you put it into your mouth and you taste it. You taste it, enjoy it, and only when it's swallowed do you put anything else on your spoon. And if the person sitting next to you, you see them chewing, they've got something on their spoon, hit them on the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, <yeah>, sorry. <laughs> 
So do one spirit at a time. It's, okay, it's a bit of trading, but it just shows you how to be in the present moment and how to enjoy your food more. Because you don't eat many times in this retreat, you better make the most of the meals you've got. <laughs> so try one spoon at a time. It's mindfulness, it's in the present moment, you get better digestion, enjoy the food more, it's really worthwhile doing. So it's a nice little practice you can do. And after a while it becomes quite natural. You eat, enjoy the flavour of the food, you'll enjoy it much more, have much better digestion, and no, uh, if you're fat like me, maybe don't do it because you digest so much more. <laughs> but, <laughs> but for most of you, it's a very good thing to do, so try that. Okay, so that's the instructions for this morning on increasing your mindfulness. Again, I am available for interviews until 20 past 10. Other than that, just please enjoy your meditation. If you need a break, take a rest. Uh, Any time of the day, you can always take a break. And that way you can just ease yourself into this retreat.